you enjoyed that good English hymn. I was thinking as our brother sang it that one of the rewards, among so many rewards of the righteous, the book of the Revelation says, <clears throat> and they shall see his face. And that reminded me of a little old cemetery up in New England where there's a great big oversized stone carving of Mr. Barnum, the man who was the head of Barnum and Bailey Circus. It's a great big massive thing and everybody goes in the cemetery to see it, photograph it. And not far away there's another little statue of a man, Tiny Tim, not the famous man that you youngsters worship. <clears throat> The old one, the original, little, little, squat, little fellow, just 20-some inches high. And people go and photograph that. And on the back of the cemetery, there's no monument, no carving, just a piece of flat stone in the ground. And if you uh, know the area, you might find it after a bit of effort. And you need to brush the dirt off it and maybe brush the moss off it. And it just has a single name on it. Doesn't say one of the greatest hymn writers in history, it just says Fanny Crosby. Nobody photographs it. Nobody stands around telling stories. They pass it up. And somebody said to Fanny one day, she was blind, I guess you know that, and somebody said to her one day, well, don't you find this a very serious handicap? She said, oh no. <laughs> Oh, no, this is no handicap being blind, and, uh, well, it has no advantage. It, oh, yes, it does. Well, what's the advantage? Oh, her face lit up, and she said, uh, Why, I, I, I've got a very unique advantage over almost every Christian that ever lived, because the first face that I ever see will be his face. My, that's wonderful, isn't it? Some faces you wish you'd never seen. <clears throat> but uh, to see his face, what, a, what an amazing reward that's going to be. I, I want to pass a message on to you this morning because uh, I think I need it as much as anybody. <laughs> so if you want to go to sleep, that's all right. Don't snore, but sleep. <clears throat> And the text is in the book that we don't talk too much from, I guess, in the, uh, <clears throat> the book of Judges. The 18th chapter, verse 24, and he said, You have taken away my gods and my priests which I made. And what have I left? you want to reduce this to the irreducible minimum, it's this. Uh, just a question for you to settle this morning. Maybe you've already settled it. How much could you lose without losing your faith in God? <clears throat> in about another half hour, Mr. Nixon is going to give the nation uh, an injection of hope. He's trying to encourage us. He's trying to tell us the financial situation isn't too bad and I'm sure you're all I wondered why you're looking happier this morning I guess it's because the stock exchange went up 19 degrees that may be why my friend Conrad is smiling here his shares are secure now and uh, it's amazing what a bit of cash will do or a drop or a rise in the stock exchange makes the whole nation happy and miserable nearly I find this a very fascinating story. It begins in the previous chapter, and it's a story of a woman, a widow, who lived on the hills of Ephraim, and she had one son by the name of Micah. He was not the prophet Micah, not related to him. And uh, it so happened that there came a preacher down the street. He didn't have a slate for and the lady said to him, would you like to be a pastor of a church? And he said, I sure would. I'm tired of running around, sleeping in motels and all these other luxuries and things. And I'd like to settle down. So she said, well, you come and pastor our church. 
We've only got two members. It doesn't say they always agreed, <clears throat> but they had two members in the church, and uh, they already had a pastor, and so they had two members, and they had uh, two uh, pastors. <clears throat> the man agreed for a certain sum of money and so many changes of raiment and free food, and everything seemed to be just right. <clears throat> They screened off a corner of the house. They had a teraphim, they had an ephod, and they had almost everything required for worship. But this woman somehow, well, women are mysterious, and this woman had managed somehow to, to gather together a fortune of money, thousands of pieces of silver. There were no banks in those days, and she hid some maybe at the end of the rafter, and maybe dug a hole in the floor like uh, Achan did to hide his treasure. And she had all this money nicely uh, sequestered away until one of those bad days came that we all get. You have to pay a bill. <clears throat> and when she needed the money, she discovered that this little cache of money had gone and that she hid over there was missing and this over here had passed off somewhere. And uh, so... She remembered the old hymn, what a privilege to carry <clears throat> everything to God in prayer. Or, the Lord is a very present help in time of trouble. Don't need him too much when everything's going well, but when you get a, a spot of trouble, you, you really pray that day if you haven't prayed for the six before it. You get down and tell the Lord how much you love him and you're the, about the most devoted follower he has within ten miles of your area and so he's really got to answer prayer for you because you're so good and virtuous and holy and righteous. And so she began to pray and not only did she pray but she did what most of us do, gave God advice. <clears throat> I think God gets a lot of advice in prayer, more advice than in his faith. <clears throat> and she told the Lord that uh, he, he should really take a hand with a thief didn't matter whether he killed him or what in the world he did, but do punish him for what he's done for me. And while she was praying, there was a knock on the door, and her own son stood there. Maybe he got scared away. She didn't usually pray so fervently, but she really meant business this time, and he, he was in trouble. And he said, Mother, the money which was stolen, behold, here it is. And she said, The Lord bless thee, my son, not for stealing the money, but for bringing it back. And then she took it down the street and she gave it to a silversmith and he, he made an image. Made a beautiful image out of the silver and so now they had a molten image and they had a graven image. They had a corner of the house screened off, they had an ephod, they had a teraphim, two gods, two priests, two people in the congregation, and uh, two images. And now everything looked to be all right when suddenly there was an invasion. The children of Dan, who were a type of the children of the devil, came on the sea. When they got to the home of this uh, man, amongst other things, they plundered the home. You see, at that time, Israel had no king. Uh, and this is as modern as today's newspaper. It says everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. That, that's really the day we're living in. Day of emancipation. Do as you like. To hell with the Ten Commandments or anything else. We're our own. We're going to do what we want. You know, sometimes you'd think the anger and wrath and convictions of these students were real. They look as real as plastic flowers until you get up and smell the things or try to handle them and discover there's nothing there at all. The kids are against pollution because, you see, you can't swim naked in dirty rivers. They're not against moral pollution. They live like beasts, lots of them. They're not concerned about spiritual pollution. They say they don't want to fight. No, they don't want to fight. I'm not justifying war. It's hellish anyhow, but they don't want to fight the Viet Cong. They just want to fight on their own campus. They don't want to kill other fellows. They just want to kill the principal of the school. They don't believe in burning buildings down unless, of course, they're on the campus. And that argument is not a sincere argument, really. They just want their own way. They're rebelling against everything that has to do with conformity, what they again call the establishment. And, and, and there's nothing new under the sun. They did that in these days. They rebelled against authority. Everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. 
Why, bless you, that's come right down to church. Never mind anywhere else. You try disciplining a church. You know, when you joined the church a hundred years ago, uh, when you joined the church, they gave you a Bible in one hand and a book of discipline in the other. Now, if you did that today, the guy would look at the Bible and say, you know, they got that wholesale. It's only worth about three ninety-five. <clears throat> and then they'd look at the book of discipline and hit the pastor on the head with it. <clears throat> Who do you think you're running around? Always they go to the doctor, you know, doubled up and say, well, now doctor, doctor, you, you tell me the worst. I mean, three people in our family died of cancer and I've had this pain all night. And I'm sure it's cancer. And he said, no, it's not cancer, it's cabbage. <coughs> and so they come out quite relieved and... Uh, and, uh, but the doctor says you should do this and do that and don't do this and don't do the other and don't eat this and don't drink between meals and all the other things. And he say, could you write it down? I, 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 I don't want to forget it because, you know, that could lengthen my life another 24 hours. And, oh boy, I don't want to go to heaven. It's a terrible place. We've just got a house with wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and we're going to have a swimming pool. And, I mean, what could heaven be after that? <clears throat> and I want to live in this dirty world as long as I can. So, so write it down, doctor. And I, I, I swear, oh, I swear with my hand to heaven and the other on my heart that I'll follow every step of discipline that you give me. Even if you tell me not to drink cokes or things that I like. I, I, I'll just do what you say because I want this old mortal body, this bag of dust to hold together as, much, as, as long as ever it will. I'm hoping to be tottering around on a stick, you know, and drawing social security for at least 20 years. What's good of paying it for 20 if you don't draw it for 20 anyhow? And I'm hoping to stay around as long as ever I can. Now, if the doctor disciplines, oh, we follow him implicitly. But if the pastor tries it, boy, we say, don't you know there's another church around the corner I can go to? And they don't discipline you anyhow. Hmm? Oh, my spirituality doesn't matter too much. I mean, uh, that's not much. The shape of my nose and my hairstyle and, you know, dear brother... Conrad said the other day, you can't turn one hair black or white, but that was before Claire all. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> but we do look after this mortal body, don't we? We're, we're, we're really concerned about it. And when the children of Dan came in, they plundered the nation. They came in the home and saw those costly, very, very precious images. And they stole them, and they stole the ephod, and they stole the teraphim, and would you believe it or not, they even stole the pastor. I guess you wish somebody would steal yours, but they, 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 they even stole the pastor, and up they ran with him. And somebody ran after Micah in the field and said, Hey, Micah, they've taken away your God and your priest. And he ran after the children of Dan, and he said, You've taken away my God and my priest, and what have I left? Well, this is really bad exposition, but let's leave the story there and make the rest of it application. How much could you lose without squealing? Huh? I mean, you've got so many things this morning, you don't even value them. You haven't even thanked God for them for, for months and months and months, have you? A few years ago in the First Methodist Church in Baltimore, Maryland, the young preacher there preached, they said, the greatest sermon he had ever preached on, and it was on Romans 8, 28. He was a handsome man. Everything had fallen, uh, the lines had fallen in pleasant places. He had been well educated. He had a fine church. He had money. He had a nice boat, a lovely home, a fine wife, wonderful children. They said that morning the glory of God came down and the he that walked in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks walked in the midst. And going out, people couldn't even thank him. The tears were still there, and they gulped and nodded, and mm, that's all they could do. They were so grateful for the presence of God, except one little old lady standing there till the congregation went. I don't know how she was raised, but she looked as though she'd been raised in vinegar or pickled in it. She was about as wrinkled as a prune and sour, and she looked round to see everybody had gone, and suddenly she lunged at the preacher and hung on to his lapels, and she said, Sure, anybody could preach Romans 8, 28 if they, if they live like you. You get a, a, a month's vacation, you've traveled much of the world, you've had education, you've money, you've everything laid down. Who couldn't be happy? Look at me. Well, I'm not too sure he wanted to, but he did. <clears throat> and uh, she began to tell a tale of all, all the things that... Are, and, and you... My husband died and left me with children to raise and we've had problems and sickness and, 
and everything else has come on top of me. I, I, I've had ten people's troubles. And she said, do you think if, if, if the walls fell out and the roof fell in, you could preach that sermon again as you preached it today? And he said, I don't, I don't know. He said, I admit I've never had many storms in life. Everything's gone very well. This church has been more than good to me, and, and, I, I, and uh, I, I really had pleasant sailing. <clears throat> well, she vented a little more of a spleen on him, and then off she went. The next Sunday morning, when the pastor came into the church, and they took him up the tall steps that go to the pulpit, he had to be led there by one of the deacons. During the week, he was cleaning his gun, and it went off. One moment, he was reading his books, his classics, and reading his Bible, his Hebrew, and his Greek. The next day, he was totally blind. And he stood up that Sunday morning, and he said, I'm very happy to be here this morning. It's been the greatest week of my life. You know what happened on Tuesday? My, my world suddenly changed. And I'm not, I, I'm not going to see anymore. And I can't even see if that little old lady is here this morning that, that uh, uh, jumped on me after last Sunday morning service and said, uh, supposing the walls go out and the roof falls in, do you think your faith will hold up then? I like the selection of hymns this good brother has, and this morning we sang, I hope you did, I've anchored my soul. You've got to anchor it somewhere. And she'd anchored, he'd anchored his soul within the veil, and he said, I want to tell you something. Jesus has never been more real to me, more intimately nigh than during this week. Some of the things I've been doing weren't too important, and now I, I, I just have to live with him, and I have to dwell in him, and I... Oh, I'm realizing it could have been much more serious than it is, even though I've lost my sight. <clears throat> and I want to tell that little old lady this morning, my face stands up to the pressure. Supposing that came your way. After all, we live in strange days. I'm not very fond of flying, but uh, it, it's far more dangerous to drive the roads. If these kids really are concerned about life and tidying up the country, why don't they pick it Milwaukee? Because they kill more people in one year than have been killed in ten years on the battlefields, but we don't pick it the brewers. If they're really concerned about pollution, why don't they, uh, and I might join them, go around the White House and demand that we put an end to importing drugs because it could be done I'm convinced of that because I went to a study in New York with David Wilkerson a few years ago and they showed how the drugs came in and they showed and gave the names of the families that control the drugs coming in why don't they rebel against that why don't they uh, picket dirty films underground films all the filthy things that are really destroying the nation no, they only want it easy for themselves. They're not sincere. I, I, uh, some may be, but mostly they're not. But you see, you've got some things this morning, and you wouldn't sell them for a million dollars. There's nobody really poor here this morning. When did you last thank God for your eyesight? <clears throat> I said uh, two or three years ago that soon you'll be able to pick up the New York Times or the... Chicago Trib or whatever you have around here and uh, uh, there'll be a list, you know, like you have a list of boats, a list of automobiles, uh, miscellaneous household things for sale and you have a, a, a calendar of spare parts. I mean, your spare parts, you know, some fellow will say I'm broke, I, I want to sell my right kidney for $25,000 and some lady will say, well, I, uh, I could manage with one eye and so I've got my eye for sale, my left eye, it's blue and I'm going to sell it for $50,000. You say that's stupid, it's your imagination, that's what I thought. Not that it was stupid, but that it was my imagination. Until I saw recently a scientist say, soon in the newspaper, we, we'll be advertising spare parts of our bodies in order to uh, raise money. Now, supposing I get you an offer of uh, just a modest $100,000 for one eye. Any of you like to raise your hand? I'll take your name and address, and I'll get you on the list. And 
don't say you haven't any money. You could sell an eye for a hundred thousand. In fact, you could sell two of them for a quarter of a million. Why not try it? I mean, you haven't thanked God for them for years, have you? Really? When, when last did you kneel down and say, well, Lord, I thank you that I can see the sunshine. Every time I drive through here, I said to my wife this morning, isn't it beautiful? You see, we lived for two years in a ghetto in New York, down in Brooklyn. Just one stop from hell. And when you live there and uh, hear shooting at night and all the other things that go with it, it it's really something to come in the country. And, and then, of course, you can read the Word of God. And then you, you think of the other wonderful thing. You can see TV with them. <clears throat> I mean, if you'd no eyes, wouldn't that be awful? And you've just got a colored TV. Oh, boy. How bad can things get? Huh? But it's really a long while since you thought that something like a quarter of a million people in America go feeling round the side of the road and tap with a stick because they want somebody to help them across the street. Uh, you, you haven't been too grateful for your eyes, your sight, have you? I remember in a church I pastored, a girl was looking through the window watching two boys fighting and one of them picked up a little rock in his anger and he threw it, but he held on a second too long and instead of hitting the boy that he hated, it came up through the window and just like blowing out a candle, put that girl's eyes out. We went down the road in Ohio not too long ago. And a preacher friend said, you see the, the, uh, that ramp there? A, a drunken man came up that ramp a while ago. It, it's the exit ramp, but he took the wrong ramp. And, and, and he went head on into a family, a Christian family, of a man and his wife and three children, and they eliminated the five of them with uh, just one crack of his car. He'd done it before, he'd had a serious, in fact, he'd had two very serious accidents, but you see, he was only drunk, he wasn't really too dangerous. <clears throat> and uh, somebody may come over the white line, uh, just, just uh, an inch or two. Uh, I mean, I know you're the best driver in the world, it's the other guy coming up that isn't good, though he says the same about you, of course, and uh, he's a little reckless. You know, your boy going down the street, down the road there, with his arm round the girl, and he, he can drive, sure he can drive. But he wants to kiss the girl and drive at the same time, which is a bit dangerous. And uh, it's a hazard driving. Oh, you could have a crippled body in uh, 50 seconds. That's all it takes. When did you last thank God for hell? When did you last really, really, really adore him and thank him that you can see the beauty of the earth and the beauty of the skies and you can read the word of God and you can have fellowship? No, no. But if we lost our sight, what would uh, really happen? <clears throat> yeah, they're, they're going to uh, sell spare parts. In fact, they say that the next major effort of medical science is that not only can we have heart transplants, they're going to start transplanting brains. A lot of us need it, I know that, but I think it's a bit risky, don't you, to, to, uh, to uh, let somebody empty a head and put somebody else's <laughs> mind in there. Isn't that something? But you have your senses this morning. I know maybe your husband doesn't think you've much, but you've got some anyhow. And maybe again and again you tell him in a crisis moment, you're so stupid. I don't think there's anybody else around here as stupid as you are. And maybe uh, you have an IQ that's not too high. Hmm? Well, you thank God for your sight, did you? What about your senses? You're intelligent enough to get around. We're intelligent enough to read, to understand, to communicate. More and more and more we're getting distressed in the nation about this plague of mental health. I know there are 50 different reasons for it. <clears throat> and I can remember not too many years ago when people who went even temporarily insane were put in straitjackets. They don't do this anymore now. They give them an injection and put them to sleep and... Uh, they have no power to fight. <clears throat> I think of one of the, maybe the greatest evangelists that Ireland ever had was W.P. Nicholson. 
And he was asked to visit a man who had some mental trouble in an institution in Oma, right in the centre of Northern Ireland, in the county of Tyrone. As he went through the gates and was walking down the pathway, there was a man three stories up and trying to get his head between the window and the, and the bar that was there. And he was hollering, hi, hi, hi. And <laughs> Nicholson is a real rough Irishman. Ah, he says, you're the fool, not me. You're not catching me out. But the man so insisted, he went back. He said, I, what do you want? He said, I want to ask you just one question. Did you kneel down when you got up this morning? Did you kneel down and thank God for your sanity? Before he could answer, he said, you see, mister, uh, somehow my mind goes wrong and, uh, and uh, I have bad spells and I beat my head against the wall and I, I, I pull my hair and I tear my flesh and, and they put me in a jacket. They tie me up. You see, while it's possible to put men on the moon and do a lot of things, we are beaten when it comes to some things we ought to have mastered. I don't think the uh, moon project was anything but a stunt of Russia to bankrupt America, and she's done it because we're billions of dollars in debt, and I don't feel any better because a guy can stand on the moon. Nobody else does. Why, we can't even cure a common cold. And there's something strangely mysterious about human personality that we'll never decide. Uh, we call people who are mentally deranged lunatics. Why? Because that lunar system, the moon up there, has a control over them. If you wanted to come into New York Harbor from England in a boat, say like the Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, which of course don't come anymore, all the other ships in the world could come into the harbor without any uh, problem, but not the Queen. They drew too much water. The danger is if they came in at low tide, they might rip the top out of the Lincoln Tunnel or the Holland Tunnel, and then everybody would be Baptist. <coughs> They'd drown the whole bunch of people going through, so they wouldn't let them come in without a tide. And if you asked to come in, a man would just turn up a book of reference and say, when do you want to go? And you say, well, I want to get there on the 4th of July. A very bad day for an Englishman to arrive in America. But anyhow... Uh, you get in on the 4th of July, and he says, sure, you can get in. The tide will be 43 feet, uh, three and a half inches deep. And he's telling you about 1972. Well, how does he know the depth of the tide? He knows it because of the uh, ability of scientists to tell us just how deep the water will be. Job talks about the sweet influences of Pleiades, a constellation in the sky which controls the frost. When there's a certain movement there are, there's a certain condition of weather on the earth. Oh, Job was nobody's fool. He has a lot of scientific questions. Not the, that the Bible is a book of science, but you can't fault it scientifically either. Because it's the wisdom of God. So here is a man, he's deranged mentally. He has no control over it. It's just like cutting a switch and suddenly he's deranged. Now you haven't had that problem, I trust, and I hope you won't have it. But I remember being in a meeting where a lady came to me after preaching a message of this type and she said, Mr. Ravenhill, I, I happen to be a person who in an accident lost my eyesight for two years. And then miraculously God restored my sight and I want to tell you, every morning when I open my eyes, the first thing I do is say, thank you, Lord, for sight. I met someone else in another state who had been in an accident and it upset their balance of power and they'd been in a mental institution for more than three years. And then miraculously the balance came back. And this woman said, I, I, I wake up every morning and the first thing I do is thank God for my sanity. You and I don't do it. We, we accept them. It's our status quo. They're my prerogatives. They're my rights. I've never been without them, so how in the world do I know how to value them? I say my senses. They're mine, but I could lose them in a moment. I could lose them in the twinkling of an eye. You see, there are some things that are mine. There are other things that are not mine. Oh, I, I live in an area now where people uh, grab the newspaper or watch TV and say, hey, how's that, uh, that new strike doing in Australia? Boy, you, you see those shares? You know, actually, some people... I, I have a friend who, a few months ago, bought some shares in that new strike. Away there in Australia, a striker's um, uh, nickel. 
In six weeks, he made a straight million dollars. He's only a young fellow. He's maybe 30 years of age, just about. He made a straight million dollars in six weeks, and he pulled out of the market. Side two. Oh, he said, I didn't stay in because I thought the whole thing will collapse. And when the, when the shares went down a couple of year, weeks ago and we began to get near to the panic situation, oh, what great distress there was. You see, there are things you have, you've no power over them. Somebody could uh, not be shooting correctly and you lose your sight. Somebody not driving wisely, you lose your limbs. A tornado could come and all your life's possessions have literally gone with the wind. And there could be an invasion of the country. How do you know there won't be? And we might be sharing what the Christians are sharing in China and in uh, Russia this morning. The walls could go out, the roof could come in, and then what? You see, there are some things that are mine and they're not mine. My health is mine, it isn't mine. I could contract a germ as a girl did in England. The daddy took her on a trip around the world for her 21st birthday and somewhere she drank something or inhaled something. And for three or four years she was just the gorgeous, lovely girl that she'd always been, the darling of the home, the only child. She studied music in the conservatoire in Milan. She had studied painting under one of the great modern masters in Belgium. She seemed to have every gift. She could sing like Gally Gertie. She could play the piano like uh, Rubenstein. She could play the violin, uh, oh man, just like Paganini, and paint pictures like, uh, I, I don't know, Van Gogh or somebody. And people would say, why does she have all the talent? But one night she went to bed. In the morning, her personal maid came and brought her the inevitable cup of tea. When she knocked at the door, there was a feeble response. When she got in, her mistress was as stiff as the edge of this desk and as straight, and from her shoulders, her head down to her feet. She hasn't moved a finger from that day to this. She can't weave the pattern of paint anymore. She can't sweep the horse's tail over the catgut. She can't dance down the keys with, with her fingers. She's impotent. She needs the attention of a child. She has not just a personal uh, uh, maid now. She has a personal nurse to give her attention. Her daddy's pocket isn't deep enough to find the answer. He's had all kinds of medical research, and they don't know what went wrong. And then one man came up, he said, look, I think I know the answer. Somewhere on a trip, in a foreign country, either you drank water or, or you, in, you inhaled a germ, and it lodged, and it went to sleep, and it stayed there like a... Uh, a sleeping bear when it's, when it's gone to sleep for the winter. And then the thing woke up. And while you were sleeping, it asserted itself and sat on the throne of power and, uh, and, and paralyzed your body. It's the only answer I can give. Not much fun living in a house which is like a castle and having servants and sports cars and everything that life could give you and furs and jewelry and she can't wear a thing or go any place at all or see anything except the ceiling she didn't want it she didn't look for it she didn't expect it but it happened on one occasion jesus he used the figure there that we use very often in evangelistic meetings. He said, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And usually the evangelist takes all the wealth of the world, the fort, gold out of Fort Knox and the jewels of Cleopatra and everything you have. And he stacks it to high heaven and says, there you have the scales. And in this pan you have all the wealth of the world. And here you have the soul of the man. And you know the soul of the man outweighs all the wealth of the world because this is eternal and this is perishing. And I don't say he's not right, but I wonder if that's what Jesus really meant. Supposing you switch the emphasis and put it where Jesus put it, I think he said, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world, if he loses his own soul? You can lose your money because the stock exchange goes down. You can lose your home because a whirlwind comes. You can lose your freedom because there's an invasion, but there's no living person, there's no demon, there's no man can lose your soul except you. And the haughty Henley, that proud pagan defying deity, said on one occasion, out of the night that troubles me, as black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods there be for my unconquerable soul. 
It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. Exactly who's arguing about it? It's your soul. If you lose it, you will lose it. There's nobody else can put your soul in pawn. There's nobody can put you into hell, whether it be a priest or a pope or anybody else. That soul is your possession. If it's lost, you lose it. It isn't subject to change and decay. I think one of the greatest miracles of modern life is a little Chinaman there, Watchman Nee, over there in China, still living, we understand. After something like 20 years of solitary confinement, living in a room 11 feet long and 4 feet wide, now how would that go on? You wouldn't need too much wall-to-wall -wall carpeting for that, would you? And no sanitary conditions. Uh, and they don't even open the door. They push his meal under the door on a, on a little bit of a tin tray that you'd hardly give your thoroughbred dog. And to me, he's one of the greatest saints in the world today. And he's been brainwashed 10,000 times, and somehow they can't break his... He, he must have learned what the hymn says, Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed. The Lord is my strength. Not my faith in him, but he, he, he himself is my strength. He is my life. He is my peace. He is my joy. <clears throat> They've taken everything else he had. <clears throat> you see, you can start peeling off all I've got till you get to my skin, and then from there inward, it's all mine. Externally, I'm subject to change and decay, to stock markets maybe, to the weather, to climate, to vicious men, to germs, disease, sickness. They can all do something. They can corrupt my body. They can strip me and leave me in anguish. I've lost everything. But there are some things that Jesus says, well, you can take your fist and you can shake your fist in the face of calamity and adversity and tragedy, in the face of the world and the flesh and the devil, and you say, those things were mine. Sure, I had a little in the bank, it's all gone. My home went with the, with the uh, tornado and everything else has perished, but there are some things I have. They're mine. I keep them there and no moth, no rust can corrupt them and no thief can break through and steal them. They're mine, I own them. My faith, my peace, my joy. They're not subject to the fluctuations of the world outside, to temperature and all it. No, 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 they're, they're mine. I was preaching in Ireland in a street meeting and an old, old Methodist preacher came along and he said, um, would you come to my home and drink some tea and have some good Irish cookies? Well, if there's anything free, I'm usually there. So uh, I went along to his lovely house on the hillside and... As I went in, his wife came. She looked a bit of an oddity to me, but I didn't pass any remarks. But she said, you've come to see my husband. And I said, yes. She said, you know, he's rather odd. <clears throat> well, I thought there are two of you, but of course, being uh, rather refined, I wouldn't say a thing like that at all. I just thought it. But uh, I said, he is? She said, yeah. Do you know what he does? I said, no. She said, he... he he spends all the day looking through microscopes and he spends all the night looking through telescopes. Well, I wondered when he went to bed. I didn't ask any questions. I said, is that so? And when we sat down to eat, the old gentleman, I saw his magnificent telescopes and things and uh, uh, after asking some questions, he said to me, um, uh, Mr. Ravenel, did, did you ever look through the eye of a fly? Well, I've been asked some stupid questions, but I thought that was about the worst of all of them. Have I ever looked through the eye of a fly? And I said, no, I haven't. The main reason, of course, because I've never been a fly. <clears throat> uh, I said, no, I've never looked through that. W would you like to look through the eye of a fly? I said, I surely would. Well, let me get my microscope. He brought his microscope, and he had a piece of glass about the length of that pencil, about an inch wide, and it had a little dot about as big as the end of that, that writing spot there. And he said, that's the eye of a fly. You, you, you slip it in the microscope. And I, I, I did, and he said, adjust it. What can you see? I said, well, I, I don't really know. Uh, uh, it looks like, um, uh, let me think, what does it look like? Uh, tapioca pudding, frog spawn, soap bubbles. 
Well, he said, yeah, that, that really is a kind of a description of it. That's right. But you see, he said, on, on, on the eye of that fly, those, those bubbles, as you say, every one of them is a lens, a lens on the eye of that fly. And, and this magnification brings up all those lenses. And do you know that a fly has 500 lenses on one eye, and every one of those lenses is set at a slightly different angle? Well, I said, that's, that's very helpful. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, a fly's got two eyes, hasn't it? He said, sure. I said, well, there you see how stupid I am. I go looking at a fly, and it can see me coming a thousand different ways. No wonder I can't catch the thing. <laughs> now he said, you take your watch and put it, and I put my watch underneath. And sure enough, through every one of those lenses, I guess there were 350 lenses. I said, about 300, every one of them. My watch, at 25 minutes to six, I can never forget it. 25 minutes to six, 350 times, 500 times, 500 times, he said. You wouldn't think that the almighty God would bother with the eye of a fly, that a little boy pulls the wings off it, or you swat the thing and kill it. It's a marvelous construction. You could never make one. Not that it works anyhow. <laughs> and on the eye of a fly, you've got 500 lenses. And if you catch a butterfly and, uh, and, 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 and took a half inch off its wing, it would be thinner than this India paper. And if you put that under a microscope, you'd find there are 3,000 triangles in that half inch of a butterfly's wing. And you, why do you have triangles? You always build with triangles for strength, don't you? You don't have to send butterflies back to the maker to get repaired like you do jet planes when they get fatigue in the metal. You say, so what? We're not here for a nature study. What are you talking about butterflies? And, and uh, what has the eye of a fly got to do with me? You don't know how pressed I am. You don't know the troubles in my life. You don't know the cares. I, 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 could, I could tell you a thousand things this morning that are breaking my heart. And uh, the pattern is all wrong. Oh, I see. You're suggesting that Almighty God designed the eye of that fly, but you, that he redeemed with his own precious blood, you're a football, the devil kicks that way if he wants, or you're a dry dead leaf and the wind of adversity blows it that way. In other words, he designed everything except that life of yours, huh? Oh, sure, he's a good God and everything goes right, but you see, he works after the counsel of his own will, not our petty judgment. It's easy to be good, it's easy to praise him when everything's going well, huh? but uh, let's look at this little man for a minute there, that fellow called Job. That's quite a book, isn't it? Oh, that's a good book to read, the book of Job. And the challenge, remember this, the challenge was not, N-O-T was not the challenge of Satan to God, it was the challenge of God to Satan. Hast thou considered my servant Job? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, what are you doing? Satan says, I've been going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down. I'm in trouble. What's your trouble? I, I, I can get everybody to doubt and fear and complain and repine and grumble. There's just one man that has his soul so fortified, I can't even get near that man. Now, now he says, Lord, I'll tell you what to do. Now, Lord, if, uh, if you think Job's as good as you really say he is, why don't you give him a real blast? And the Lord says, well, I'll tell you, I'm too busy doing other things, but I'll tell you what to do, you go do it. Hmm? Did you ever think the Lord might employ Satan to make you a saint? Ah, oh, you thought he'd put you in a glass case and put a sign on, thou shalt not touch my darling child. Huh? And the Lord says the only way to test your faith is really let the devil have a go at you. But wait a minute, he couldn't, he, he couldn't do anything until he got a permit from the Lord. I don't believe the Lord can come in, the devil can come in on your life and mine without a permit. Oh, no, 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 where the apple of his eye, where, where his treasure. Go on, Satan, now you have a blast. So Satan comes along and he has a great time. Job goes to bed, a multimillionaire, he wakes up a pauper, he hasn't got a thing. His cattle have gone, his herds have gone, and somebody comes in and says, I want to tell you, calamity came and... Uh, and the Sabaeans came and they took something and somebody else came and took your camels and your crops are gone and, and John says, well, that's rough, isn't it? 
but praise the Lord. But what? Well, praise the Lord. And somebody comes in panic and says, Oh, what are you doing here? Oh, I was just telling Job he's lost all his money in investment. Job, I've got worse uh, news for you. Uh, y- your children, sudden sons and your sudden daughters were having a, a, a feast, having a party, and, and, and suddenly there was, a, there was a tornado came and, and destroyed them all. The first stroke of Satan against him was bankruptcy. He left everything. The second stroke was bereavement. It's a bit rough to go to 14 funerals in one day, isn't it? Bury 14 relatives. Some of you would like to do it, I know. But not if they were your sons and your daughters. Now, now, Satan says, now we'll watch him. Hmm. Yesterday he was bankrupt. Today he snowed under with bereavement. Are you all listening? Now, 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 wait, wait. Soon as he gets, and they start putting the bodies in the ground, you'll hear him grumble and gripe and say, and this is what you get for serving God. Uh, God already has testified I'm the most perfect one in the world, and this horrible blast comes. Well, what's the report? Uh, Satan, I see you're back, the Lord says, and he says, yes, I'm back, Lord. I, uh, uh, how did you get on? Not making any progress. Well, did you really beat him up? Yeah, I sure did. I sent him bankrupt yesterday. He lost millions, and today he lost his children uh, in bereavement. And uh, what did he say? Well, he just looked up joyfully, and he said, the Lord gave, and the devil took it all away. What a lousy deal. No, that's not what he said. That's what we say. Yeah? When things are going well, do you know why we, we... We just opened another shop, you know. We'd only one a while ago. We've got two now. And, you know, we'd only so many cattle and we've got more. And, you know, business is really going, oh, the Lord's good. And then you see a man a year or two after and say, how are things? He said, well, you know, the Lord prospered me for about five years. And then the devil came in and took it. Oh, didn't he? <laughs> I didn't know that was in the Amplified even. <clears throat> the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Right, he's got bankruptcy, he's got bereavement. There's only one thing now. Uh, 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 well, uh, will you give me a permit to touch his body and then you'll hear him. Oh, you let me touch his body. After all, he can roll his sleeves up and say I might become a millionaire again and uh, who knows, he might still have another family but... But if you let me just get all of that body of his and weaken it and make him suffer and squeal with pain, you, you, you hear something heaven hasn't heard for a long, long while. And the Lord says, go ahead, go ahead, Satan, have a good time. First stroke bereavement, second stroke bankruptcy, third stroke boils. Did you ever have any? I, I once had, I think, 17 in a row. Oh, brother, were they? I thought I was Job all over again. Oh, were they painful. Job couldn't walk, he had them on his feet, and he couldn't sit down, and he couldn't sleep, and he couldn't rest, and he was in real trouble. And when everything was dark, bankruptcy, bereavement, boils, his friends came along. And as somebody said, with friends like this, you don't need enemies. Eliphaz the Temanite sat in that corner, Bildad the Shuhite sat over there, and the other guys sat here. And then, and then, to make bad worse, his wife came. And she said, you know the reason why you're like this. Now, why don't you be sensible and admit that somewhere there's sin in your life and, and curse God and that. The Hebrew there really means, why don't you commit suicide? Get out of it. Yeah, I know what's wrong with you. Yeah, I know your problem. You see, uh, no man suffers like this. Bankruptcy, bereavement, boils, everything like this. There's a reason for this. Sure, there's a reason. God is going to put him on record so nobody else could ever grumble from here to eternity. He came to knock all the gripes out of you and out of me. And, and, and why you should ask any questions? And they started pouring all their criticism on him. And poor old Job got up and scratched where it itched the most. And, and he stood there and he says, sure, everything's bad. Sure, I'm bankrupt. Sure, I'm bereavement. Sure, I've got boys. But I want to tell you something. If it even gets worse than this, and even if I die and wounds destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. I know that my Redeemer lives. 
What do you do with a man like that that won't give it? Hmm? Ah, oh, there are some things you and I have, we've no power over them, but there are some things we have that, are, that belong to me. No moth, no rust can corrupt, and no thief can break through and steal them. They're mine. They're not subject to whoever is in authority in the White House or any other house. There is gift. He's built them within. He wants them to become stronger. Not that I weaken in them, but these are my shield and my defense and my strength. I don't know a great deal about American poetry, but I know when I was a, a boy in England, we used to uh, have to recite a, a, a wonderful classic piece that uh, some of you must know. If you've been to university, you'll know it. It's called Little Orphan Annie. <clears throat> And it was written by James Whitcomb Riley, I think, wasn't it? And he wrote another poem called The Robbers. I think it's a wonderful poem. It's a marvelous philosophy. In that poem he says this, The night was dark, and the night was late when the robbers came to rob him. They picked the lock of the palace gate, those robbers that came to rob him. They picked the lock of the palace gate, they stole his jewels, his gems of state, his coffers of gold, and his priceless plate. When the robbers came to rob him, but loud laughed he in the morning red when the robbers came to rob him. He was hidden safe as he slept in bed when the robbers came to rob him, and they robbed him not of a single shred of the childish dreams in his wise old head, and they're welcome to all things else, he said when the robbers came to rob him. You see what he says? You can steal my jewels, my gems of state, my coffers of gold, my priceless place, but I've got memories in here you can't take away. I've got something in here and it's impossible to destroy it. Somebody has said that the greatest verse in the Bible along this line is in the end of that little prophecy of Habakkuk, or Habakkuk if you like. Though the fig tree shall not blossom, Though there be no fruit in the vine, the labor of the olive shall fail, the field shall yield no meat, the herd shall be cut off from the stall. And when it is, I'll just sit down and cry. Doesn't say that. He says, when it's as black as black can make it, there's nothing to eat, there's nothing to see, it's darkness, it's bankruptcy. And then he says, I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. And the Hebrew there really means this, <coughs> I'll dance in his presence and I'll sing aloud his praises. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a lovely old hymn written by Charles Wesley. Let me finish with it must finish on a good note and quote a good English hymn. <clears throat> and Charles Wesley summarizes the whole of this argument up like this. He says, the waves and storms go o'er my head. The wealth and health and strength are gone. The joys are withered all and dead, and every comfort be withdrawn. On this my steadfast soul relies. Father, thy mercy never dies. And if you want to put the cherry on top of the cake, think of the end of Romans 8. Get past verse 28. And Paul summarizes those things that would threaten to assassinate us spiritually. And he runs through that amazing catalog and what does he say? Well, he says, there may be tribulation and distress and famine and peril and nakedness and sword. And it's easy to swallow the whole lump there, but why don't you put them out in a row and say, well, you see, uh, uh, nakedness, that couldn't be on my soul. That must be nakedness of my body. I, I could even be stripped to that degree. Nakedness and sword, you can't put a sword through my spirit, you know, I might have to face even the firing line if the communists come into power. Tribulation, distress, famine, peril, nakedness, sword, height, no death. 
Then he puts his shoulders back with a kind of a holy swagger and looks in the face of the devil and he says, you can't invent one thing in hell that can separate me from the love of God. You can separate me from my friends and tie me up in prison. You can take all my earthly goods and destroy them, but I want to tell you something. There's nothing you have invented or can invent that can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus my Lord. And when you think of it like that, surely you want to say, hallelujah. What a savior.